Good morning, everyone. I am Bhanu Prakash, and I work for Intel. So before I start this talk, let me tell you something that happened this year. In the beginning of 2016, one of the largest and the leading telecom service provider of Australia, which is Telstra, had a major outage. The outage was so bad that it impacted 17 million subscribers across Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide. Almost all the major cities were impacted. And the outage lasted for close to four hours before the services were brought back to normal. It goes without saying that people were very angry and they vented their frustration and anger on Telstra on various social media platforms. So what the Telstra company did was, so they want to do the damage control. So the chief operating officer of Telstra came back and she publicly apologized. And not just that, she offered a free data day. The free data day in the sense, any data that gets downloaded on that specific day is absolutely free. So 1,800 terabytes of data was downloaded on that free data day. And the surprising thing is, one guy from Sydney downloaded one terabyte of data. And you can search for him. He's called the Telstra data guy. <laughs> so how he did that was using the Telstra 4GX technology that got introduced in 2015. So everybody was happy because they got a free data day, and they just ignored that this is one off incident and no problem. And then the problem happened. The second outage happened in the first week of March. The third outage happened in the fourth week of March. The fourth outage happened in June. So there were four back-to-back -back outages on a major telecom service network in Australia. And then the inevitable happened. The chief operating officer of Telstra stepped down. She resigned and she retired after spending 12 years at Telstra. The case of Telstra is not alone. If you pull the data of the cloud service operators for the last two years, they have been having so many back-to-back -back unplanned downtime. You can get the data from Cloud Harmony website. So welcome to the talk on service assurance. We are going to quickly go through the problem space. How we are going to solve this problem using the barometer project and the use case example here, which we are going to demo towards the end of this session. And we would discuss about the obvious TPDK key pillar feature. And we would touch base on the CollectD and the Cellometer that would help you to augment barometer project to solve this particular use case, followed by summary. The problem space. The telecom networks are reliable, should be reliable. And in fact, they are incredibly reliable. So what do carriers promise their customers? Two things, the quality of network and the performance. Everyone here are subscribers of the carrier services. Whenever we make a voice call or whenever we use data, we expect the service to be always available. That means the telecom carrier has to make sure there is no downtime. We call it zero downtime. Zero downtime is a myth. It's mission impossible. So what carriers focus is the carrier-grade performance. Carrier-grade performance as such has different requirements on different levels of availability. The first thing that strikes our mind when people talk about carrier-grade software is the number of nines. As you can see here, if a carrier-grade software promises two nines, the maximum unplanned, I would say, unplanned downtime in a year can't exceed 3.65 days. If somebody promises four nines, it can't exceed 52.56 minutes, not bad. If somebody promises six nines, the maximum unplanned downtime in a year can't exceed 31.5 seconds. And this is not going to be easy. And there are few guys who promise seven nines and nine nines. I don't know how they are doing that. So it's not just about the availability. The problem is, if there is a problem in your networks, it depends upon how fast you recover from the problem. It always has to be sub-second. So some requirement says, if there is a problem, you should recover within five milliseconds. And that's not really easy. And the best example is Telstra. It took four hours for them to recover their networks. So if you see in the last two years, most of the cloud service operators has been offering contractual uptime guarantees. If the availability falls down a specific threshold, they would give you back the money. Take the example of Amazon Web Services. 
If you read the service level agreement of Amazon Web Services, they say, if the availability is less than 99%, you would get back 30% of the money. So for Amazon, every second matters. And a downtime of every millisecond, they are going to lose back money to the customers. And most importantly, the cloud service providers has been considering OVS DPDK as a compelling solution because OVS DPDK can do line rate packet processing for smaller packets, which is very important for telecom networks. And they also have been asking for reliable service assurance platforms because performance is not everything. The carrier grade has three main features, availability, manageability, and performance. Performance is the last thing. The availability and manageability are the most important thing. And so to ensure availability, we should have a good service assurance platform. That's where this particular project comes into picture. The barometer, this is a new name of SFQM. SFQM stands for Software Fastpath Service Quality Metrics, and this is an OPNFE project. I think most of you would know OPNFE. If you don't know OPNFE, OPNFE stands for Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization, and it's a career-grade open source reference platform for NFE. So what is barometer, and why do you need barometer? You need barometer for just one thing, enforce SLAs, that's it. <laughs> and what can I do with barometer? You can enable interfaces to monitor network function virtualization infrastructure, and you can collect a lot of statistics, and you can gather events at runtime from your platforms. Barometer as such has three important functionalities. The first functionality is the traffic monitoring and the performance monitoring of the components that especially provide the network functionality to your VNFs. The second functionality is platform monitoring. That includes CPU, memory, disks, thermals, voltages, fan speeds, machine exceptions, everything on your system. The third thing is system anomalies. This gets interesting. The application crashes, the thread crashes, the deadlocks, starvations, all of these unexplained cases will fall into system anomalies. And this is what we are going to discuss today. This is a very simple use case I would use here to demonstrate the service assurance platform we are trying to build at Intel. And it's a very simple OpenStack deployment where I have a compute and the controller. As you can see here, both the compute and the controller are running OVS DPDK. And you can see two VNFs on compute, and the VNFs are running some workloads, and they're connected to OVS DPDK using the vhost user ports. So the health of the switch is most important in the NFE deployments. So in case of OVS DPDK, the PMD threads are most important. So in this particular example, I have four PMD threads running. The PMD threads are running on core four, core five, core six, and core seven. Please remember that because we are going to see the same thing in the demo, four, five, six, and seven. And we are going to simulate some problems here to see if we can detect the system anomalies and report it back to the management layers. So the first thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin or spawn a real-time thread on the core where the PMD thread is running. So the PMD thread would starve here, and this information has to be reported to the management layers. The second case is I would crash the OVS. So this particular case also has to be detected and reported to the management layers. So who does this monitoring? So we have a monitoring agent named CollectD, which does the monitoring of your statistics and events, and it would report back all these events to the OpenStack service that runs on your controller. So the CollectD runs on your compute, and if you have 10 computes, and you have 10 different CollectDs running on the corresponding computes, and all of these CollectDs would report the information back to the Cellometer. Cellometer is an OpenStack service, and that internally talks to another OpenStack service called A or AODH, whatever people call it, and that's mostly an alarming project. We would stop at Cellometer. We won't discuss much about AODH here. And this is how internally your compute would look like. The CollectD internally has two plugins, one read plugin called CollectD DPDK events. The other one is the write plugin, which is the CollectD Cellometer plugin. So to implement obvious DPDK KeepLF feature, we need four components here. We need DPDK, because the obvious DPDK liveness feature is fundamentally based on DPDK KeepLF feature. That's why we need DPDK KeepLF feature, and more importantly, we use DPDK libraries. So the second thing is CollectD. CollectD is a system statistics statement that is very good at 
gathering all the statistics and all the events on the system. So this is available on almost all the distributions. And you can just do yum install or apt-get, and you should be able to get collecting. The third thing is OpenStack, because we use the Celometer here. And that's why OpenStack component is mentioned here. The last thing is OPNFE. Uh, Intel has been developing few collect deep plugins, which are part of the OPNFE barometer project. And if you hook in all these plugins into the collect deep service, we can get or we can achieve the end to end functionality. So these are the four components. Let's get started with DPDK KeepLA feature. This is a very simple DPDK application example to demonstrate the KeepLA feature. So I have three cores here the RX core, the worker cores, and the TX core. The RX core would receive packets from the DPDK ports and he would act more like a distributor or a balancer. He would send on the packets to the worker cores. The worker cores would process the packets, and they would forward the packets to the TX core, and TX core would send the packets to the transmitting port. But there is a fundamental problem here. The worker cores, when they process the packets, after processing the packets, if you look at the packets, they are not in the same order as they are received. So when the TX core receives all the packets from the worker cores, the packets are completely out of order. So what the TX code does is it internally uses the DPDK reorder library to reorder these packets. And once the packets are reordered, he would transmit the packets to the transmitting port. So the chances of one of these codes getting into inconsistent state is pretty high. So what the user typically wants is he wants to monitor the health of the course here. It can be RX core, it can be worker course, or it can be TX core. So how he will do that is using a keep alive monitoring agent core. So this particular monitoring agent runs on a different core. And what he does is he would dispatch pings or heartbeats to the packet processing cores. If a particular packet processing core misses a heartbeat, then he would consider that particular core as dead. And he would write that information into the shared memory. This is how the DPDK keep alive feature would work. Let's see how this is implemented. I wish you can see this text inside. So we have this uh, monitoring agent running on the core 0. And as you know what a DPDK application does, it initializes your environment abstraction layer. It creates your mempools. It does the port configuration. It initializes the timer. Finally, it creates the shared memory. Shared memory is important because that's the place where we are going to sh store the core status and the last seen timestamps of the cores. And then it would initialize the key alive data structures. And finally, the monitoring agent would launch the cores or the threads on the corresponding cores, like core 1 and core 2. After that, he would like to register the corresponding cores for the, to the key alive monitoring framework. Because you can have 28 cores on your machine or 56 cores, and you don't want to monitor all the cores, because there could be hardly four or five packet processing cores and you have to only monitor those cores. So that's why you have to register those cores into the monitoring framework. And after that, he would dispatch the pings. So he would send the pings to these cores which are doing the packet processing. And it's the responsibility of the packet processing cores to respond to these pings by marking themselves alive. So that's why we have this function, RT keep alive, mark alive. So as long as this is working, there is no problem. If a particular PMD thread gets into a starvation case or some kind of deadlock case, and if he hasn't marked itself alive, then the monitoring agent would think that there is a problem with this particular core or thread, and he would mark that as dead, and he would also update the shared memory with the last seen timestamp. Extending the same functionality to OVS DPDK, the vSwitch 3D thread here would do the DPDK initialization, create the shared memories, update this, I mean, create the key alive data structures. He would also create a OVS key alive thread. And after that, he would launch the PMD threads on the corresponding cores, basing on the PMD CPU mask. After that, he would register the corresponding PMD cores to the keep alive framework. And then the obvious keep alive thread would start dispatching the pings. And it's the responsibility of the PMD threads to mark themselves alive. That's done in the receive loop. As you can see, there is a for loop inside you know, the main loop where it keeps processing, it keeps you know, pulling for the packets from the ports. And that's where it has to mark itself alive. As long as it is working, there is no problem. If a particular PMD thread gets into some kind of starvation cases, that's what we are going to demo today. And, you know, that status won't be updated. And then the keep alive thread would update the status into the shared memory. And then he would declare that particular core as dead. So it's very simple to enable this feature. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do is just set TPDK keep alive equal to true in your database. And you also have to mention the interval. The 10 here is 
the, is 10 milliseconds. So you can also work with five milliseconds, even three milliseconds. I haven't tested with one millisecond as such, but if a particular PMD thread is starving, it would detect that particular cases in no time. So this is how uh, you know, the shared memory would look like. You have the primary process, which is writing things into the shared memory, and you have the external application, which is trying to map the shared memory and read the information back from the shared memory. So the core states are interesting. So there are like close to seven states. I would explain these states. A core state of unused means this particular core is not registered for the keep alive monitoring. The alive is the core is alive. It's running something. The dead is this particular packet processing core has missed two successive heartbeats. And the gone state is slightly confusing because if a particular code doesn't respond to two pings, we would consider it dead. And if it doesn't respond to any further pings, we would mark it gone. So the missing state is quite interesting because there could be a PMD thread which is running, but because of some kind of problem, because of some logs or some kind of spikes, he's not able to respond to pings in timely manner. So that's when this missing state comes into picture. And the last two states are dozing and sleep. We haven't implemented it right now, but would be used in future cases where the hibernation probably will come into picture. And the timestamps we are going to store is the epoch timestamp. You can see here that there are a couple of cores here. Core zero state is unused. Core one state is unused. Two is unused because we haven't registered that. Core three went missing. Core four is alive. Core five is dead. And you can also see the last seen timestamp of all these cores in the shared memory. It's just a matter of time that an external application would read this information and, and you know, relay this information to the proper OpenStack services. So we were talking about the monitoring agent uh, in the previous slide. In this case, the monitoring agent is nothing but your CollectD. So this is just a brief information of CollectD, what CollectD is. So it time series data, it's an open source project. It's under GPL v2 license. It's platform independent. That's the best part. It supports 100 plus plugins. It has very good networking features. It's very extensible. You can implement plugins. It works beautifully. Unfortunately, it doesn't generate graphs. It can only write data into the CSV files. So people think CollectD can generate graphs. It doesn't generate graphs. So this is how finally it would look like. We have the obvious DPDK, and this information is collected by the CollectD daemons. And the CollectD, we have implemented a few barometer plugins. And there are quite a few barometer plugins, if you can see here. DPDK stats plugin does wonderful work because it can read the extended NIC statistics and even the error registers from your NICs. The DPDK event plugin can detect the link status and also the core status. We have the Cellometer plugin that can write data into the Cellometer. And we have the Hughes Pages plugin that can get the information of the Hughes Pages, the number of Hughes Pages, the number of you know, oversubscribed Hughes Pages, or surplus pages, or all that kind of information. We have the obvious stats plugin that's not mentioned here that can get the flow and interface stats. We also have the obvious events plugin. So for this particular work, we are only using two plugins, the DPDK events plugin and the DPDK Cellometer plugin. So if you see the CollectD infrastructure, the plugins are not, are not so difficult. You can see I just needed these four plugins to get my obvious DPDK key pillar feature working. The right three plugins are, are like the standard plugins. It's the syslog plugin, the CSV plugin where I write the data, and the other one is the log file. And the left one is what is important, the DPDK events plugin. And this is where you can see I have the shared memory information present, and also I have the interval here. The interval is one here, but if you want to mention something in milliseconds, you need to do 0.001 or something. So it works there. So this is the brief information about the CollectD events plugin. And next, coming to the Cellometer. So one has to send all this information to the Cellometer service, uh, which is in the OpenStack. And as you know, OpenStack is implemented in Python. And there should be some kind of uh, an extra plugin which can convert all this raw data uh, and post this information to the Cellometer. That's what this CollectD OpenStack plugin or the Cellometer plugin will do. He will collect all the information and push this information to the OpenStack Cellometer service. And the feature work, uh, the OBS stats plugin is work under progress. OBS events plugin is work under progress. Uh, Mariam Tahan, my colleague, is working on this. Uh, she's working for the barometer, uh, the OPNFE barometer project, and she's the one who implements all of this. She and her team will do that. So let's go to the demo here.
So we are on the controller right now, and I'm listing all the meters on my cellometer. So I would just introduce this terminology. So the meters are nothing but the tools to uh, measure your resources. So you can measure your, I just passed it. It's not running. Uh, OK. I don't know why it's not. I don't know. Mark, can you just help me with this? I can see it here. Okay, so what are you looking for? So I need to play this. OK, sure. It's extended. Just duplicate it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Better? I think we need to. Probably present this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Good. Can play this. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Okay. So, uh, so we are going to list all the meters in the cello meter. The meter is just like. Uh, measuring your resource. We can have multiple meters here. It can be CPU, it can be memory, it can be interfaces, or it can be images. So we are on the controller, we are listing all the meters here. And we are listing the DPDK events meter. So right now, there are no events because we haven't captured any major events there, so it is empty right now. So now we are on the compute. So as I said, we have four PMD threads running here, core 4, core 5, core 6, and core 7. You can see PMD 108, 109, 110, and 111. And we also have the collect the service running on the compute. So the active. It's running. So now what I would do is I would like to starve one of the PMD thread by spawning a real-time thread on the same core where the PMD thread is running. So that's done by the stress command. And I would affinitize the stress thread to the same core, core 4. So now you can see the stress thread running at 80%. And now what I would do is I would change the thread attributes to real time. Hyphen R is real time, hyphen P99 is the highest priority of the real time process. So now you can see you would only see four PMD threads after this. Sorry, you will see only the three PMD threads and the stress thread running. So one PMD thread is completely starved. So that means there is a problem with your data path. That has to be detected. It's detected here and the thread that's running on the core 4 is completely stabbed. 2.0, as I said, the core status stands for dead. So the core 4 is dead right now. All of this is detected within millisecond granularity. So now we are going to kill the stress thread and now see if the core is back to life. And the four PMD threads are running now, and they are all at 99.9 .9 because they are polling. And you should see 1.0 status, which is alive status. Yes, you see that. And your core is back to life now. And then we would like to do the same thing for the other PMD threads, because we have four PMD threads. 
and the PMD threads can get into some kind of uh, inconsistent states. We would just like to simulate the same thing for the other PMD threads. 0x20 stands for core phi. That's the affinity of core phi. Because earlier we saw the status of core 4. And we changed the thread attributes of the stress command to real time. That means the PMD thread is starved here. And you can see that only three PMD threads are running right now, 108, 10, and 11. 109 is missing. And you should see the dead state on core 5. Yes, L core 5. L core 5 is missing right now. So now we would kill the stress thread. And that means this thread should be back to normal. So you should see 1.0 in the volume section there. Yes. And then I'm going to kill the obvious V switch T here. So I'm going to send a SigaBot signal to the obvious V switch T. So all my PMD threads will go away. So this has to be detected instantly. So if you see on the top, all the threads will go away now. So now you should see the status of all the four PMD threads. They're running on core four, five, six, and seven. So 2.0 means the score is dead. So once the silometer gets this information, the alarm or the other OpenStack services retrieves this information from the silometer, and then basing on the policy, it would take the necessary action. The actions can be migrating the VMs to a safe compute, or uh, it can be you know, marking this compute offline, it's up to the policy. You know, we don't talk about the policy here. It's because this particular work is about relaying the information to the cellometer, and it's up to the OpenStack services to decide upon the data here. So the summary, trying to manage a complex cloud solution without a proper telemetry infrastructure in place is like trying to walk a busy highway with blind eyes and deaf ears. So that's all. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer.